All right, then. Okay. Okay, I think we're still allowing admitting some people in. We'll give it about another 30 seconds or so. Uh-huh. I'm seeing names I haven't seen in a while. Oh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, and thank you for joining us for our inaugural gathering of Research Bites. My name is Marilyn Willis, and I am the Assistant Director at the Center for the Study of Race, Politics, and Culture, better known as CSRPC. The monthly Research by series is one of many programs that we are in initiating to celebrate the center's 25th year anniversary. Um, I'd like to give a shout out to our CSRPC uh, program administrator, Tiara Kilpatrick for conceiving this idea um, and following through with the series. Also, congrats to those of you who are enjoying the Lunch Bites on us from Grubhub. We hope to be able to meet in real life real soon uh, for Research Bites over lunch sometime in the near future. Our goal for this series is to connect staff from across the university with faculty affiliates of the center who study, teach, and write about race and ethnicity. Some of us work closely with faculty regularly, but many of us do not. We wanted to create an informal space for staff members to learn firsthand about some of the exciting research happening on campus and to provide an opportunity for networking between faculty and staff with hope that we will find some shared interests and possibilities for future collaborations. Today, our speaker is Kathy Cohen, who is very well known around U Chicago and will be in conversation today with Jonathan Likes, a Black queer artist, activist, and academic. Please give a warm welcome. You can use your reactions because we are not in person um, for Kathy and Jonathan. All right, uh, can everyone, let's see, I hope this works. I hope everyone can hear me. Um, thanks Marilyn and the larger crew at CSRPC for inviting me to share some of my research, um, introduce myself to staff. I, I think I know a number of the folks uh, whose pictures and names I can see. Um, and I'm really, thrilled to be in conversation with Jonathan Likes, who has known me almost as long as I've been at this university. Jonathan was first a student, now he's a comrade. Um, and so my goal is to do a kind of quick intro of some of the work I've done in the past. I have like five slides, I'm gonna share a slide deck with you. And then Jonathan and I are gonna have a bit of a conversation, and then I'm gonna to turn to um, more recent research. It, this format may work, it may not. Either way, it'll be lovely to be in conversation with Jonathan and really nice to um, be here with all of you. And I should say the other part of this is, uh, there will be, I think, some designated time at the end for people to have questions, but if you have a question about something I'm saying now, um, folks should feel free to just kind of add the question into the chat. And hello to folks I haven't seen in a while. I'm really happy to see your names and hopefully see your faces. Um, so let me start just by sharing my screen. Uh, and of course the, <laughs> oh, here we go. All right, it's like, and it's not there. All right. Um, the first, let me just say the first five slides and I'll go through them pretty quickly is just meant to kind of orient people in terms of past research and when you've been in the academy as long as I have, there's lots of things you could put on a slide. I tried to 
pick five pieces that I think kind of define my research trajectory. So you have a sense of that. I'm thinking of this again as an introduction. Um, my first kind of published piece was an edited volume called Women Transforming Politics. And I think you're gonna see throughout the presentation that I'm really interested in folks who are, have been racialized and marginalized, um, both in terms of what does it mean to kind of exist in a political system and a society from that position, but more importantly, for me at least, how people resist, right? How they reimagine their relationship to a country, to an economy, um, to policing, right? And how they come together collectively um, to kind of move that agenda. And as I was, Jonathan and I were talking, I, as I was going through the first slides, I said, what I'm noticing is I've made some really bad decisions in terms of <laughs> what you're supposed to do in the academy. And I have survived, at least I've been invited to give a research bite. Um, but this first edited volume, for example, as a junior faculty, you are told don't do edited volumes because they take a lot of time and you don't get a lot of credit. Um, but I found it really kind of enriching to be engaged again in a collective process of knowledge production, right? That where we could highlight folks who maybe wouldn't have a chance in a more traditional uh, discipline or more traditional journal to have their work published. And so a lot of the work in this early book is really from other junior faculty writing about women who are often thought to have been marginalized in the ways in which they resist. Okay. Um, one of the articles that also kind of define my work is this article. I always, of course, love the title, Punks, Bull Daggers, and Welfare Queens. Um, and it really was a piece meant to think about what does political solidarity look like, right? Um, and how do we think about political power? Um, and much to my surprise, this has been a piece that really has kind of defined my career. Um, I, I was telling Jonathan again, we were talking earlier, it, it's kind of funny because um, my first position was at Yale. It was in AFAM and political science. Uh, I think the folks in AFAM knew and helped me think through this piece. The faculty in political science still to this day have no idea that I've written this piece. Um, and it really has been a piece that has kind of lived both in the academy, but outside the academy. I still have young scholars and young activists who come to me and say that this was a very important piece for them about kind of how do we build coalition and what does solidarity look like. Um, my first kind of single authored book was The Boundaries of Blackness, which was an examination of the response to HIV and AIDS in black communities but really, um, and I shouldn't say really, but it was meant to think about the nature of kind of cross-cutting issues, intersectional positionings, or kind of the ways in which there isn't a consensus or homogenous black politics. And how do we think about kind of identities of sexuality and gender and class as they intersect with blackness? And what does that mean for a kind of public political agenda that gets pursued? Who is demonized or something we call, I call secondary marginalization in the book, right? And who is thought to kind of, who can represent the community. And so it has kind of continued, this, this book was a continuation of my kind of interest in interrogating political solidarity. Like how do we define black people? How do we define black politics? Who gets left out of those discussions, right? Um, oops, I went the wrong way. Another piece, I promise you there are only five, so we're at number four, is uh, Deviance as Resistance. And again, I, again, I'm just trying to give you a sense of where my head is when we think about kind of research, right? I'm interested in the ways in which folks who are often thought to be on the margin kind of reimagine themselves. And in this case, the question is, might we think of something we have, or the society labels, labels as deviance, as a form of resistance that might provide us with new ways of thinking about the world, new ways of organizing family, new ways of identifying and engaging in kind of sexual performance, sexual identities, right? A new type of politics. And it was meant to say, if, if we think about kind of queer theory and queer politics, and if we think about 
African American politics and we bring those together, what it, how is it generative? How does it tell us something new? Um, and how do we think about resistance, right? Of course, collective resistance, but the ways in which individual Black people every day struggle for agency, struggle for joy, right? Demand that their humanity is, is recognized. Um, and how does deviance figure into that, that work of resistance? All right, last but not least is um, this book, Democracy Remix, which the subtitle tells you is about young black people, right? And in this case, I said the future of American politics. But again, if we take young people as the kind of central subjects of not just only a political agenda, but again, the kind of work of reimagining, if we take them as the central subjects, what does it tell us about the failures of democracy? and also the possibilities of reimagining um, structures of governance, the economy, and again, kind of collective mobilization, um, as well as the ways in which we just engage with each other. How, what do young people want for their futures? How do they understand their position in a political community um, and the failures and the failings of that political community? So those in many ways kind of tell you the trajectory. There is a, there's a kind of, form here that says I'm interested because I feel like I'm positioned as a black lesbian woman um, on the margins. But look, I, I'm at this kind of uh, big deal university. So I understand the contradictions in that. Um, but if we take folks who are often on the margins, right? And we center them in our analysis, how does it change the questions that we ask? You know, how does it change maybe some of the methodologies or push back on traditional methodologies? And what does it mean, I think, and this is where I really wanna go, what does it mean for our responsibility in terms of the way in which we produce work and disseminate work? And how do we do that in partnership, right? And here's this slide. So in the, in the background of all of that work, are different political formations that I have been a part of. And people would say, oh my goodness, what happened to objectivity? Um, you know, we're all influenced no matter where we are as scholars by the things that are around us, those, th those things we choose to be a part of and those things and structures that we are embedded in. Um, and for me, these have been important, not just political formations, but intellectual sites of intellectual interrogation. In each one of these places where I've done political work, there have been people who have helped me think through new ways of asking questions, right? Who um, have said, not only the intellectual work has to happen, but are you looking at different sources than you would if you were just talking to a bunch of political scientists? How do you do this work in partnership? And for me, the most important thing is how does the, the work travel outside the academy in a way that it is relevant to people who are in struggle, um, both in struggle in their neighborhoods, right? Um, but also formally in struggle um, in organizations and, and doing that work. Okay, um, one last slide and then Jonathan jumps in, which is all of this has produce, well, well, let me go back to that slide, which means I've just, I'm older than maybe I'd like to say. <laughs> so the beauty is I've had this really incredible opportunity to work with really amazing people. And all of those organizations influence me, but also influence kind of the world in, in different ways. Doesn't mean that they all exist anymore. And there are lots more I could put there, but I don't want to underestimate the importance of political activity in terms of intellectual production. All right, um, and so all of, all of that work has led me to be engaged in what we call, what people call, and I, I guess I'll accept this idea of public facing research, right? Research that is meant, of course, to influence the theories, the ways in which we conceptualize um, ideas, uh, you know, different concepts in the academy, but also work that is meant not only to kind of inform people outside the academy, but should be accessible to those folks, right? We should make sure that the data, and I do a lot of survey work, which I'll talk about later, that that is, um, uh, you know, it's available to people who want to engage with it, that we provide um, 
infrastructure to help people engage with that work, right? Um, the, the, the data, of course, will influence our careers, but that can't be the reason that we're doing this work. Um, or at least for me, that can't be the only reason we're doing this work. So Jonathan, I don't know if you wanna jump in here. And Yeah, this is a great way for me to jump in. Uh, <laughs> thank you for inviting me to this discussion, CSRPC and Dr. Cohen. Um, so immediately what comes to mind, particularly on this topic of public facing research at the university is this idea that they inundate all first years with the life of the mind. And it always <laughs> confused me as a student, both in undergrad and grad school at U Chicago, life of the mind, life of the mind. And, and I'm like, well, what are we doing with all of this, all of this brilliance, all of this intellect? It seemed as such a waste to believe in this idea of knowledge just for the sake of knowledge. So I'm just wondering, can you give us a, a few more examples of the importance of public facing research, what mm. that has looked like mm. in different entities? Uh, Dr. Cohen is extremely humble. If we go back to that activism slide, many of those organizations Dr. Cohen created or co-founded or was on the board of. Um, but yes, this idea of public facing research, can we just yeah. dive into that a little bit more? Yeah. So, you know, I, I love that. You, I think people should understand that you were a student here, you got your, your undergraduate degree, your master's degree, so you know the language of the life of the mind. I, I love that, in fact, somehow we believe that to produce the life of the mind is to, you know, you have to be in the ivory towers, like the life of the mind isn't happening <laughs> in Inglewood. <laughs> you know, like, really, that's exactly. not the life of the mind also. Um, but, you know, I, I think there, I think people who even ascribe to the idea of the life of the mind, and I don't want to diminish it in the sense of that many of us have chosen as a profession, right, to be engaged in structures that are meant to produce knowledge. Now, and I don't also want to say that the knowledge that's being produced isn't, doesn't somehow make its way into the world and have a positive impact on the world. I think with public facing research, at least for me, it is a more kind of focused intentionality in terms of being into the world, right? It's not an afterthought or a spillover effect or a nice benefit that just happened. But in fact, it's a part of the structure of how I think about my research, right? Like, okay, I'm going to engage in this project. Who are the partners I need to talk to? What are the kind of questions I'm answering? Both kind of a general intellectual question that's based possibly in my discipline, but how also does this work matter to people who might not be writing articles, but who are in fact, you know, uh, shaping movements, right? I, I think how we understand the public and our accountability to that public, then should I, I would like to say, influence the type of research that we produce. And so I'm gonna give you an example of BYP and the Black Youth Project for, Folks, okay, can I show a video? I have to show the video. I'm gonna introduce the BYP, the Black Youth Project here through a video that was, Jonathan tells me 12 years ago we produced it. So Jonathan was a part of um, BYP. Um, so just give us a minute and a half to watch that video and tell me if you can't hear it, or hopefully you can. Can you hear? We're not able to hear. Can't hear? Can't hear? No. No, can't hear it. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, well, first of all, this young man there, this young person there <laughs> is Jonathan. Um, does anyone, if, um, does if, anyone if they, in the chat know how to do this? If, if you all can make me co-host out, I can play it from my computer or maybe that's doing too much. That's all right. I mean, I don't. Uh, Huh, this is gonna break my heart. I had this whole idea that I was gonna show you the video. Let me, oh, I have an idea. Wait. If you Jonathan, go to YouTube. you're the co-host now. Can you hear it now? Can you hear it now? I am 19. You can hear. Oh, which, yes. People from the various communities can come together and get information. Finally, there's a place on the web where 
young black people can speak for themselves. My words, now is the bridging of the gap between the academic tools, and so youth can learn about the data sets that are out there about us. You can get information from the Raptors database. You can find a whole number of videos as well as articles and blogs that talk about the pop in a way that respects young black people. It is a place where the perspectives of young black people will be heard loud and clear. Books that I was never supposed to read. Too often we hear of the extremes, either those that have made it or really the millions of young people who are incarcerated and find themselves in failing schools. I'm sorry to say, your best friend is gone because gone. Well, now you know why I don't pick up the phone. And we can actually talk about things that matter to us. A lot of youth have something to say now. We understand now and we want our voices heard now. And the floor, what have every civil rights be? Every war, every story that your grandmother's spoke words are told. There is a remnant of educated young black activists screaming to ears that have yet to be listened to. Hi, my name is Lee. Edward James. Dr. Likes. I'm Summer. And my name is Justin. My name is Camille. Alexandra Mafazato. Hi, I'm Candy Cohen. I'm 19 years old. I'm 19. 24 years old. I am 17 years old. I am a blogger. I am a blogger. Uh, the principal investigator. I'm a poet. That's what I need to know. When I was one day old, my voice began to beat out into a cry. I would not be silent. I will be heard. Uh -huh. Okay. So can everybody hear me again? Yes. The reason I wanted to show that was one wow we all were so young <laughs> but it i think really kind of underscores what we were trying to do with the black youth project it started out let me be very clear as a research project um we were going to have a, and we did have the kind of really first national representative survey focused on young black people where we built the survey uh, a new survey a new questionnaire focused on the lives of young black people. So it included a section on hip hop. It included a section on kind of alienation or you know, measures of alienation towards the political system and things of that sort. It, we built that for, a, uh, it took us a year. We would meet every Monday. There were a group of graduate students and undergraduates who were working as part of this. So it was already a collective process. We got this data um, and I was writing a book. And I will say that the young folks uh, who were a part of the project were <laughs> very clear and they said we have to do something more right we've been in neighborhoods we've talked to people um I we, they appreciated that I would write a book democracy remix but there was like how else do we make the data available to the public again public facing so we you know it was a long time ago it was like 2009 we built we built a a, a website right at first it was very static looked like a traditional you know academic data uh, website. And again, young people said it has to be more, it has to be more uh, engaged. And we built out the Black Youth Project. The Black Youth Project then became many, many different things. One of which was it hosted the convening. Okay, stop. I know you want your voice heard, Jonathan, but. <laughs> Wasn't me, I promise. <laughs> I can't even get off the slide. There we go. Okay, we'll get to that. Um, but one of the things it did was it hosted the convening that led to the creation of BYP 100, a very important activist organization in the movement for Black Lives and this larger movement. But so sometimes the work evolves. I knew that it, it needed to be public facing and I thought, oh, we'll have this book and we'll have some presentations and we'll work with community groups. But it was really the young people in the room when you do work collectively and you respect the people in the room, right? Who said, no, 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 no. This was like the cutting edge of kind of social media and folks were like, we have an opportunity to do something bigger. And, and, and I repeat this all the time, people said, there, there's a kind of new space called the internet, of course. We need to kind of claim some space for black people, for young black people, right? Where, and I say this all the time, where they can speak about the issues that are important to them without censorship. And there have been moments, the Black Youth Project website is still in existence, when things go up on the site that I totally disagree with, but that's not my work, right? That's the work of the people curating what will be on the Black Youth Project website. And it was really, um, Jonathan, I know you asked, it was 
wanting to make sure we had a space to amplify voices, but also continue to measure voices because that's important also, that led us to kind of create the Gen Forward project. And I'm gonna go back if I can, there we go, to those two. So, not, so I answer your life of the mind question. I just realized that's what you you did, you did absolutely. I mean, so so just to just to recap the history of BYP is so exciting for me. Imagine nineteen year old some someone just private messaged me saying, "I remember that baby face." Nineteen year old Jonathan like coming into University of Chicago, uh, first generation college student. No one else in my family had ever had this experience to 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 prep me for what University of Chicago was. So obviously it was um, just a, a special moment to be a part of not only Black Youth Project, but to have Kathy as a mentor uh, still to this day, but particularly at this early point in my life. So Kathy, I have two questions tie tying two things together here. One, um, you said um, the, the responsibility that we hold. What does it mean for our responsibility to produce and disseminate work in partnership with communities? So that's a theme that goes throughout your work. Um, but then the other thing you said is people who have helped you think about new ways of asking questions. So uh, one, it's this theme of breaking the ivory tower, uh, making sure that the work we do doesn't stay just at UChicago, but it enters into the communities of those at the front lines of marginalization. The other piece for me is this theme of, of mentorship. And I'm sure this is something that all of the staff here um, know the importance of, but how do we think about uh, the importance of, uh, of, of mentorship in these spaces, having people in your life that can challenge you to ask new questions, uh, to be better, to do the work with a sharper analysis. Um, and how, 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 is, how have those things showed up in your life? And as you've created so many of these moments uh, throughout my upbringing, but so many of the moments throughout an activism uh, that's a part of this Black radical tradition, um, for us to think about resistance and transformation in new ways. Great questions. And I, I want to say again, we're trying out this format, Marilyn and the rest. You all will tell us later. You'll be like, that is not what we were trying to do. But we'll, we'll see. <laughs> um, I think it's a great question, Jonathan, about responsibility and the accountability, right? Which is, um, here's the thing. I've spent most of my career in some spaces where people uh, say that they are writing about Black people, right? That is my commitment also. But I always worry when we do that work without being accountable to Black people, mm -hmm. right? It is, that's, the, that's one of the lessons yeah. about activism that you learn, right? That in fact, you mm -hmm. need to working collectively. There are people who need to be able to be in positions to challenge you, to say that, wow, what you represented there isn't the truth. And there's a tension. Right, and I know there are some folks who um, might hear that and say, wait, 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 we want the academy to be a place where there's free speech and people can uh, think differently about issues. That's how innovation happens. I'm not saying we don't want that, but I'm saying at the same time that we have free spaces, right? Where people can reimagine and think differently, um, we also want accountability. We want to produce something that we might call truth, right? We want to say that in fact, we're taking into account the voices, the perspectives, the positionality of communities of folks. We want to say that as we're work, working and writing about black people, we're in conversation with black people that it's not just conversation, but that in fact, they have the opportunity to shape what we write and how we think and how we research. We do that with our colleagues in our departments. Why wouldn't we do that with the people that we're supposedly writing about and the people we supposedly care about? So to me, public facing, of course, is about accessibility. But for me as a scholar, when I think about um, my work, I want my work validated by the people and the quote unquote subjects I'm writing about as well as my colleagues. When, when, we have, when we're writing a book, we have book workshops and we bring in experts. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing. We bring in experts to help us think about what we're writing because they have a depth of knowledge in the literature 
and there are people who have a depth of knowledge in the lived experience that we're rep representing. And so how do we also incorporate those folks into the work, into holding us accountable? Or not even accountable, but people feel uncomfortable right, and to giving us feedback, right, to being in conversation. That is the way in which you generate knowledge. You don't generate knowledge just off on your own. You're always thinking about it. And the last thing I'll say in terms of staff, and I, I will take full responsibility, I don't think we have um, built the relationships and bridges and community with staff that can also hold us accountable, right? Like, I'm writing about young people, I'm out there, I'm gonna be in conversation with m for bl or BYP 100 and, right? But there's, there are young people on the staff that I should also be talking to. And I'm hoping that this type of project will start to build those relationships and those communities. The last thing I'm gonna say, I know, is I just wanna give a shout out to Tracy Matthews, who's uh, away somewhere watching this. Um, Tracy has been a part of my life for a very long time, helped produce the BYP uh, video, helped think about BYP, BYP 100. So, you know, there are people that you know who have lots of power, you know, power on set, but we need to build, I think, more bridges, more relationships, and hopefully that's what we're doing. Yeah. Okay, oh, mentorship, <laughs> reimagining and mentorship. I, and then we're, I do wanna show some of the research from, uh, the Gen 4 project as an example of what we're doing now. So um, mentorship, you know, I don't love the language of mentorship, usually because people think of it as uh, uni or one directional, right? There's the person who has this knowledge and then there's the person who's take getting the knowledge. And I don't think that's usually how it works. Um, you know, I work with uh, and study young people, in particular young uh, folks of color, often from BIPOC communities, um, it would be ridiculous for me to say, I have all the knowledge and, and I'm giving them knowledge, right? Like there is a, again, I keep using the language of conversation, but there's a dialogue that happens. I know some things, they know other things, right? Um, they know how to turn on the sound on the Zoom. I know how to find the, the video <laughs> to get there. We can produce something. So, uh, you know, I, I, I guess it's mentorship, but you know, it, you, you wanna untangle that and figure out kind of the questions of power that go along with mentorship. And, um, but I think if we can talk about building networks of communication, dialogue, partnership, I, I'm down for that. Um, and then there was something else I wrote down reimagining, but I don't remember what it was. No, no, no worries. That was a beautiful answer to all of my questions. I think the, the staff had to get a lot out of that. And I, I will just add, um, not only did I have, you know, I, I, I felt uh, I gravitated to Dr. Cohen because of this emergence, this connection between the academy and activism and felt a lot of frustration um, in the college of uh, just kind of getting stuck in intellectualism without that being a, a path to actually do work. So obviously, I, you know, my connection with Kathy is I showed up every day for her mentor, uh, for her office hours <laughs> and said, what can I do? I'm here to help. Like, so I, my interaction is this multi-directional passing of knowledge back and forth, passing of ideas. And I had that, I was lucky enough to have that with Dr. Cohen, but I will say I had that with many, many more staff on campus at, uh, at um, I worked at OMSA or it was called 5710 back then. Um, and just, just the amount of staff that had an impact on my life. And eventually I pivoted uh, towards going to SSA, the School for Social Service Administration, um, because of this desire to connect with more activism, activist, activist professor organizers on campus. Um, so towards that th theme, I think we should now shift to uh, what I, uh, Dr. Cohn is still the, the chief investigator uh, I am the Director of Programs and Partnerships for the Gen Forward Survey. Um, so uh, we will uh, uh, talk about how Gen Forward in, in some ways came out of the research and work of uh, Black Youth Project. 
uh, but Kathy, I will allow you to then go in uh, into more depth on some of the most recent research that has come out of the Gen Forward Survey Project. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you. Um, so now let's see if I can get this. Oh my goodness, this is, I do feel like, what is happening? Hold on, people. There we go, yay. Um, so I, I just wanna do a, a few minutes to say, you know, we built, and I say we, all of us, uh, BYP. BYP has done amazing things. It continues to exist in the world. I would say it's less of a, not, I'm not saying intellectual, less of an academic project, um, but it is an important space for amplifying voice. We, we still wanted to collect data at its most basic level um, on young people for lots of different constituencies but including young people, including activists, and including academics. Um, and so we started the Gen Ford project. Gen Ford, I'll, I'll say in a minute, but people have often said, well, why young adults? The project focuses on 18 to 36. There's a slide here that says, hey, you know, they represent over 50% of the population, most racially and ethnically diverse, right? They're part of significant part of the workforce, um, eligible voters. There's a kind of critical period of transition to adulthood. But we're really also interested in the precarity of young people, right? How do we understand what it is to kind of live in a changing economy, uh, in a gig economy, where you've often entered into the economy during recessions, either the Great Recession or the COVID reception, recession, right? This is a generation that has more student debt than we've ever seen. It's a generation, if you look at the bottom, in their kind of longer transition to adulthood, who's less likely to own a home than any other generation at this time. They've dealt with generational trauma and they've seen the kind of revolutionizing of the media landscape, right? Through the use of social and uh, or more broadly digital media. So we wanted to figure out a way to kind of consistently, and again, uh, make sure that we were tracking and paying attention to what they're thinking. And that's where Gen Ford emerges, right? It's a nationally representative survey of 18 to 36 year olds. We believe it's the largest and most frequent, meaning it's now quarterly. At one point it was monthly and then bi-monthly. It's just a lot of work. So we keep like saying, oh, we got to pull back. Um, but it has over samples of African-American, Latinx, and Asian Pacific Islander young adults, right? So we're able to we call it disaggregate by race and ethnicity to say, okay, generally people say, well, how does the, how do millennials compare to baby boomers? Well, we want to look inside millennials and Gen Zers to see how they vary on very important issues and ideas based on race and ethnicity. And again, at the bottom, it's meant to amplify the voices and the power of young people. If in fact, you can point to data in our society, sometimes it actually matters. And so we want to be a part of a kind of movement infrastructure to give more tools. And in this case, it's the data tool. Um, I'm not going to go through that. So I'm going to show you just a few things that we're able to do. I'm trying to check the time. So we consistently ask a question about what's the most important problem facing this country today. That's a question that everybody, lots of people put on their surveys. The reason I pulled this slide out is just to say one of the things that we know, we started Gen Ford in 2016. Since 2016, almost in every survey, maybe two or three, that hasn't been the case, um, racism was named as the number one issue facing African Americans by African Americans. And it's, you know, it's a list of probably 20, 25 possibilities. Um, but here, I want you to notice that even in the midst of the pandemic, and that's why you see other groups naming uh, COVID or coronavirus, right? even in the midst of that, young African-Americans are saying racism. And so some people will say, well, people you know, were outraged by the killing of George Floyd, absolutely, uh, by the murder of George Floyd. But long before the murder of George Floyd, young people, and in particular young African-Americans have been living with systemic racism and saying repeatedly on our surveys, it's racism. If you wanna know the biggest problem, it's racism. And so if you're not, surveying young people and if you're not asking a whole series of questions about matter about issues that matter to them you don't hear their voices when when you turn on the television and they say the public thinks this 
Often those polls or surveys don't include significant numbers of young people, and in particular young people of color. So you don't get, hey, the number one issue is racism. All right, so let me just go through a couple other slides. It also means that if we control the survey, we can ask the questions uh, that we want. So we've asked this question, how serious a problem do you think the killing of black people by the police is in the United States? We started asking it in 2016 and we've uh, asked it all the way through 2020. And here you're just seeing the trend data, the margin the, you know, of frequencies. Um, there are two things I, I wanna point out. People often say, oh my goodness, look, why is it 81 uh, in August and 92 you know, there's some fluctuation and that's, I would argue, significant fluctuation that we'd wanna figure out. But what you need to say, see is also overwhelmingly young people and in particular African-American young people say this is a major problem or a very serious or extremely serious problem. At the other end, this has also been really interesting for us because really it wasn't until, right, the mobilization into the streets in the summer of 2020 that a majority of young white people said it was a very or extremely serious problem, right? That prior to that, and again, we're very close and there's a margin of error. So you could say probably it was a majority, but the numbers say that prior to that, there wasn't a majority. And so if you only look at generations and you say, oh, millennials and Gen Zers are the most kind of liberal or racially diverse generation, then you miss, in fact, really important differences in terms of how they think about issues of race, right? A um, couple more I'll just show you. Also, if you ask one question and don't produce nuance, you can take away, you can have the wrong takeaway. So when we ask the question about should police departments in the United States be defunded or abolished, we know that less than a majority of any group said yes to those questions. So you can say, oh, they don't want it departments to be defunded and they don't want them to be abolished. These activists are ridiculous. Why are they asking for that? Why are they promoting that? Now we know also that what we appreciate about activism is it often introduces new ideas and forces us to rethink and reimagine how we might approach those policy issues or those issues in general. So now if you ask a different type of question, right, which is would you support or oppose creating a new agency, right, of post first responders that specialize in de escalation. If you look at the first two bar charts, right, because that's strongly support and somewhat support, then you see overwhelming support for that. So maybe they don't want the idea of defund or they don't understand the idea of defund, but they do understand that policing as it exists right now isn't working. And so let's rethink what might, in fact, be possible. It's similar if you ask, like, should they divest their entire budgets or part of their budgets towards something, towards investments, right? If you add the investment part, you start to see that, yeah, maybe we should divest part of their budget into something different, right? And our worry is that when you have surveys that aren't thinking about, first of all, the positions of young people in general, but young people of color, and are more interested in finding that kind of one takeaway, look, they don't support defund, then you miss out on the nuance and the kind of dynamic nature of the thinking about what might be possible, right? I, I think this goes back to Jonathan's question about if, if we are talking to people who are positioned having to think through and live through the deficiencies in our structures, oftentimes they are helping us to reimagine what might be possible and maybe we can add those questions. I think this is the last. So yeah, this is the last one I wanna, and then we can get maybe more questions. But we also asked this question, what's the best way to make racial progress in the United States? And as we were kind of thinking through the answer set, right, the answers that would be provided, I think someone, I don't remember who was on the team said, well, we should include revolution. And some questions could use to include revolution. And people were like, not, why would we include revolution? Who's going to pick revolution? You know, and we said, no, no, no. Let's just, let's just put it on. Let's see. And consistently, right? Revolution has been the most popular answer from African Americans. In this case, one out of every, we could say one out of every five African American respondents chooses revolution. The first time I saw it, I thought, eh. but there's a consistency here, which is that 
when you ask how to make racial progress and actually when we ask how to make progress, right? Um, for young people of color, often it's much more nonviolent protests and demonstrations, organizing in communities. It's never voting at the kind of national level. That we include national elections, never part of what people think makes progress, right? And I think for revolution, what young African Americans are saying, at least when I've talked to them, is that they they may not fully understand what's what it is to be a part of a revolution, but what they understand is that the structural um, deficiencies, the structural racism that they face, to to really challenge and transform that is to to ask for something much bigger than voting in an election is what they understand. So I think that in many cases in many ways is what the revolution symbolizes. But again, if we're not creating public uh, research projects that are thinking about how people are differently positioned, that are in conversation, that are willing to ask questions that don't make traditional sense in, the, you know, in certain disciplines, um, then we never get to these answers where we can struggle with kind of what, what do we think folks are saying? How are they nuanced in their thinking? What are their kind of new points of reimagining something like public safety or police, you know, policing? And that's literally what we're trying to do with Gen 4, which is to say there are topics and policies and politics out there that are critically important to the lives of young people that threaten their lives. Yet we don't pay attention to how they think about these issues. And if we if we believe in fact that some, some of their lived experience, some of their incredible knowledge, some of their brilliance can help us think differently about these issues. We've got to talk to them. We've got to measure their ideas and attitudes, and we've got to ask questions that matter to them. And that really is what the Gen 4 project is, is meant to do. Now, I know we only have, we should be getting to questions, but John, yeah. do you want to say two minutes about kind of the nature of partnerships also in the work that we're trying to do? Sure, absolutely. So over the last uh, nearly two years now, we've been developing um, deep sustainable partnerships with policy think tanks, with community organizers on the ground. Um, so we have uh, launched a Data for Liberation webinar series. It really is, a, a, the, the theme of this whole talk is really how are we breaking down the walls of the ivory tower and making sure that research is accessible and built in partnership with folks at the front lines of marginalization. Um, so in many ways, our partnership work within the Gen Forward survey aims to do just that. So some of our partners have been uh, with the Movement for Black Lives or with Next 100, which is a program out of the Century Foundation where they're raising up a new generation of policy fellows. Uh, we've had uh, partnerships with Financial Health Network. So it really is geared towards the goal of uh, moving uh, beyond the academy and connecting this I, I have not seen any data shop like Gen Forward out there. I think that's important to say that, that nothing like this exists. Um, so, so this data is cherished. Um, and I think it's important that we connect with uh, folks on the ground to not only co-develop data with communities, uh, but to make sure that the data that uh, we're, uh, the knowledge that we're producing is in partnership with those at the front lines. So I'm gonna pivot us to the Q and A section. Uh, so really quick, one question was, okay, well, where's this data? How do we find it? I did see Jalisa post the Gen Forward survey link. I'm gonna post a more specific link um, that is a direct link to the data on the Gen Forward website. Uh, so you can find all of the data there. Uh, we encourage you to take a look at that. Uh, I see another question. Oh, go on, Kathy. Hey, I was just going to say, uh, I'm going to this last slide. There was a whole bunch of other slides that we'll never get to, but I'm happy to talk to people individually. Um, but you can also go to the genforcesurvey.com, and it's a website where you can download the data. It's accessible to the public. You can also now um, manipulate the data, create your own slide decks and um, bar charts and things like that. So. Um, Go to genfortsurvey.com. So one question I saw is, is probably most relevant to this discussion with staff is what 
could be the role or what is the role of staff when it comes to the work that you do uh, at UFC, but in the world, <laughs> Dr. Cole. <laughs> You know, I love this back and forth, Dr. Cohen Cat. You uh, so, <laughs> showing up, but um, you know that that is a very good question, right? And I suspect that there might be people, um, and I don't want to say on staff, but people who have an interest in data who might want to work with us on Gen Four. People might have ideas about what the survey should include, and and on Gen Four, you might want to work with us on that. You might have ideas about how we can disseminate the data more um, efficiently and effectively, for example, on campus, because I don't think a lot of people on campus even know about the data. So it seems to me that there's the, there's the possibility of working in formations where you're thinking about the actual content, about dissemination, about, you know, what might be on the website. I, you know, again, this goes back to, I feel like my own failings, which when we're thinking about a project and we're thinking about community, there are organizations I will go to that are largely outside the university, but we haven't figured out the process of thinking about community here on campus, right? Part of both faculty and staff is we also represent community at some level. And so if we're looking for outside voices who might be inside, that, that might be another possibility. But I am I'm interested in open to all sorts of ideas if, if folks have ideas. And people might also have other research projects they think we should pursue. I haven't, we didn't talk about it, but we also did a Chicago-based um, project called Race and Place that you can find on the, on the website where we interviewed 200 young people in the city of Chicago right, to think about how living in different neighborhoods, kind of the racial spatial divide matter in terms of how they think about politics, their economic experiences. We included violence, but we didn't want that to overwhelm the document and the work that we were doing. So we also included joy, like how do they experience joy in the city of Chicago living in different neighborhoods? So we, we thought the work was really interesting. That might've been a great project to also include um, staff from around the university thinking about what was happening in their neighborhood. Wonderful, so um, a couple other questions. One was, can we share details on the Data for Liberation series? So I'll drop a link in one moment, but just a little bit more about Data for Liberation. The ultimate purpose is twofold. One, we hope uh, to liberate data from the grips of the academy and prevent it from being soiled in the academy. Second, we hope that this project will further the use of data within movement work as a liberating tool for marginalized people. So folks can read more about our Data for Liberation series from the Gen Forward Survey Project just drop the link there. Um, and we do have a, uh, we're continuing our Data for Liberation series next month, where we will be hosting a Data for, Libera uh, Data for Liberation webinar in partnership with Equis, um, a data shop uh, that does national data, particularly around immigration and immigrant communities. Okay, okay, the, the recording. All right, so here we go. Higher education institutions used to be uh, primary locations of organizing and protests. Do you still see college campuses as still having potency in larger racial justice movements? Dr. Cohen. Uh, you're so funny. And you should answer this too. Uh, absolutely. I mean, I think um, if you take a place like the University of Chicago, if you take um, Care Not Cops, if you take ethnic studies now, right? that these are, these continue to be kind of sites of struggle, um, often more for students than for faculty. I'm very proud to see Ali and others who are part of the more than diversity campaign, you know? So I think uh, faculty have kind of gotten themselves together to replicate the kind of struggle that we see from students all the time. But I, again, I think for the question of policing, there's, um, there's a kind of national campaign, Cops Off Campus, where people are mobilizing to rethink public safety um, and demanding the abolition of police forces on campus. Now, people might not agree with that, but again, it's an important kind of point or jumping off point for discussion about 
how we might reimagine public safety. Everybody wants to be safe. And you know that's a critical moment here at this university, but are there ways we can foster safety that don't always involve policing? And I think part of there's a group of us, E. Healing, myself and others, who are really trying to think through that question for the more than diversity um, folks. So I don't, it sounds like there's another question, but I don't, yeah. Can I just, oh, one more thing, which is another- yeah, And just to add one, one note, oh, go on. Really, I'm sorry, really, which is uh, part of an organization uh, called Scholars for Social Justice. And that's an organization that are trying to kind of provide a, a formation or a site for individuals who identify themselves as scholars who want to think about how our work can contribute to an agenda of, for social justice. So that's another example of that. Okay. Sorry. No, no, great. This is all great information. We have about four more minutes left. So maybe we can get to two more questions if we're quick. Uh, one question is, are there current fundraising efforts, connections with development staff to host public facing research symposiums that might feature gen forward data? Always open. <laughs> yeah, bring it on. Bring it on. I mean, look, the work of Jen Ford is funded by the MacArthur Foundation, the Open Society, and the Lincoln Foundation. So I cannot complain about funding. Um, and of course, the social science division has been supportive. But yeah, if the developmental development office wants to figure out a way to endow, endow, endow Jen Forward, let's let's do it. Now, you know, that could be seen as a contradiction, but let's do it, yeah. I think we can close there. If there are no other questions, I believe we got through most of them that I saw, uh, but it has been uh, my honor to be able to uh, be here <laughs> uh, with Dr. Cohen. Thank you. Would you like to give closing thoughts? No, I, you know, I, again, I'm gonna go back to, we're, we're more sure about the format, but the format for me is reflective of how I feel like I've done my best work, which is in collaboration, in conversation, um, recognizing you know that we don't know it all. And so the more voices, the more people we can interact with, usually the better the work is. Um, and it's, you know, I can't thank the, the folks at the center enough for having this um, program and for all the ways that they've supported the work I've done throughout my time here at the university, sometimes they have kept me grounded and feeling like I can survive this place. Um, so I, I just feel very lucky to be a part of this community and to be in conversation with Jonathan, who I respect and learn from and love dearly. It has been a pleasure and thank you, Trey, Tracy, Matthews.